Hello, and welcome to your lecture on social Darwinism and imperialism. Grab your student notes and use them to follow along and fill in the blanks. Down south, things were going south. In the west, settlers were seeking out new lands and new opportunities. And in the north, business was Booming. The period of time between the 1870s and 1900 is known as the Gilded Age, and it was marked by powerful businessmen grown wealthy from factories and new technology, by a growing middle class suddenly able to afford goods they'd never been able to before. And underneath all that shiny wealth, a rotten core the miserable state of the poor who worked in those factories 10 to 12 hours a day, six days a week, and then returned home to their dark, crowded, filthy, airless apartments. In those days, rich people and poor people actually lived really close to one another. Rich people and middle class people and poor people saw each other every day on the street. And so it was inevitable that people would begin to wonder why is it that some people are rich and some people are poor? What duty do we have to each other as human beings to help each other out? Some people responded to these questions by forming charitable aid societies. They worked to educate poor children, to change terrible conditions in factories and to feed the hungry. Other people responded differently. You see, back in 1859, Charles Darwin published a book that had absolutely nothing to do with either poor people or rich people. It was called On the Origin of Species, and in it, Charles Darwin put forward the theory of natural selection. In a nutshell, natural selection said that in any species, there are going to be members that can't adapt very well to their environment, and there'll be members of that same species that end up adapting really well. As you might guess, the animals that are able to adapt really well to their environment will survive longer, they'll have offspring, and they'll pass on that ability to adapt to their offspring. Over time, this increased adaptability will make the species stronger as a whole. Well, this book was very widely read. It had a huge impact on the way that people thought. And so people started to wonder if natural selection might not apply to human beings as well. There was a British philosopher named Herbert Spencer who had an idea even worse than his facial hair, and that was to apply natural selection directly to human society. In fact, he was the one who coined the term survival of the fittest. He believed that all of humanity was engaged in a competition to see who would survive. The more fit members of society would succeed. They would survive and pass on their genes to their offspring. But the unfit, the weaker members of society, unable to adapt to changing circumstances, would lose that competition. They would die, and in their passing, they would benefit humanity. The human race would be better off without them. Well, so Herbert Spencer took this new theory called social Darwinism, and he began to look at human society and try to decipher who were the fit and who were the unfit. All right, he said, who is doing really well in our society? Who is being able to compete? Who is able to adapt? Why the wealthy, of course, and to a lesser extent, the middle class. These are the fit the ones who will survive and pass on their genes to the offspring. And they are fit because they are better than everybody else. They are better with money, they are harder working, and they're more virtuous. They will survive and pass on their virtuous, hard working and frugal genes to their children. And who are the unfit? Who are those weak, incapable members of society unable to adapt? The poor. They're not getting very far in life. They must be the unfit. They're the ones who will die, and after they're dead, the human race will be better off. They aren't just unfit in a general sense. They're unfit through and through. They are less good than other people. They are lazy. They are sinful. And the last thing that we want them to do is to pass those lazy and sinful genes on to their children. 
And if you can see where this is going, Herbert Spencer and other social Darwinists went a step further and said that private charities and government programs that were designed to help poor people were actually hurting humanity. Why? Because if you give these people food, if you help them have better living and working conditions, they will live longer lives. And if they have longer lives, they'll have more kids and they will pass on these lazy and sinful genes and they will prevent humanity from improving itself. No, say the social Darwinists, get rid of all the charities, get rid of all the programs, let the poor people die, humanity will be better off without them. Not everyone subscribed to this harmful idea. There were still many people fighting for reforms and working to help poor people, but enough people did that it did affect United States policy and the thinking of many powerful people in the country. It affected thinking not just at home, but abroad as well. So I'd like to take a minute and introduce you to the concept of imperialism. Imperialism is when a nation expands its power over other nations through force. And this can take a couple of different forms. The most obvious form of imperialism is when a country looks at another country and says, hey, that looks like a prime piece of real estate don't mind if I move in. And they go and they conquer that country and they set up their own government and their own laws and they rule the people there. This enables them to take those countries' resources quite handily. The other form of imperialism, which you might not think of as first of at first, is through trade. The Industrial Revolution had caused all of these factories to spring up, all of these new industries to take wing. At first, these factories were able to produce lots and lots of goods and sell them to people in the country, sell them people back home. But eventually, these factories became so big that they were capable of producing more goods than the people these countries wanted to buy. Well, they could produce less, or they could try to sell their goods to foreign markets. Of course, if you go to another country and you start making trade deals with them and the trade deals benefit both sides, they're fair, that's not imperialism. That is just good business. However, if your technique for getting new markets to sell your goods to is to go to the country and force them to trade with you, that is imperialism. Then it looks something like this. Powerful country goes to weaker country and says, hi, I want to trade with you. I want you to buy all of my stuff at an unfair price. Oh, and you can't trade with anyone else. You'll just buy my stuff. I'm not really going to do anything for you in return. Deal? And the weaker country says, no, why would I want to do that? And the stronger country says, you want to do that because I happen to have an enormous military, and I will destroy you if you don't trade with me. And the weaker country says, oh. This gumboat diplomacy is the other form of imperialism, forcing countries to sign disadvantageous trade deals with you so that you can sell your stuff to them. Whether it is through creating colonies or forcing countries to sign bad tra trade deals with you, imperialism was really attractive to many countries. After all, it enabled them to get rich resources and new markets. What's not to love? And Europe had been in the business of imperialism for a long time. Remember, the United States of America was originally a British colony, and we were hardly the first place to be colonized. By 1898, so much of the world had been conquered, either through direct colonies or through trade deals, that if you look at a map of the world from 1898, you will see that almost the entirety of the globe belonged to Europe. British imperialist, that means he loves imperialism, Cecil Rhodes had this to say, 
the world is nearly all parceled out, and what there is left of it is being divided up, conquered, and colonized. To think of these stars that you see overhead at night, these vast worlds which we could never reach. I would annex the planets if I could. I often think of that. It makes me sad to see them so clear and yet so far. As I say, Europe had been in the business of imperialism for a long time. The United States, growing powerful, wanted to be in on the imperialism game as well. They got their chance with China. But before we get to China, I want to take a minute to look at the ways in which people justified imperialism. After all, these people weren't monsters. They were normal people. And very few normal people like to say, oh yeah, I'm going to go in and treat another country and another people horribly in order to satisfy my own greed. No, they need other reasons. And those reasons came in the forms of our old friends, racism and social Darwinism. Now, racism, as you'll remember, is the belief that a person's abilities, intelligence, or character come not on an individual basis, but as a result of somebody's skin color. And social Darwinism is the belief that some people are inherently fit and destined to survive and better off the human race, and some people are inherently unfit and their passing will only improve humanity. You can see how well these two work together. Racism says that non-white people just aren't as good as white people. Well, social Darwinism chimes in and says, hey, it's not just that they're not as good, they're not as fit. It's in the natural order of things that white people conquer them. It's simple science. But again, remember, we're talking normal people. Most people still aren't comfortable with this thought that we white people are so awesome, it's better if non-white people all died. And so you see a softer justification of imperialism come in that has its roots in that racism and social Darwinism, but isn't quite as harsh. And the thinking here went that Western culture is obviously superior to all these non-white cultures. And so by bringing Western culture into these other countries, we will guide the non-whites into a better state of being. We will raise them up and even if they never get quite as good as we are, they'll be a lot better off. If this reminds you of white Southerners justification for holding slaves by saying that blacks needed white masters to take care of them, you are on the right track. It is exactly the same sort of thinking. We're doing a favor by conquering them. I'm sure that all those places will say thank you. And now back to China. China was very attractive to imperialists. The goods that China produced, its delicious tea, its lustrous silk, its perfect porcelain were highly desired items in the European market. Europeans wanted Chinese goods and European countries wanted great deals with China to make sure that they got them. And so European countries began carving up China into spheres of influence. Within each country's sphere, it could rule ports and have power and great trade deals. China, in other words, was becoming a series of colonies in pretty much everything but Maine. European countries weren't the only ones who wanted in on the Chinese market. The United States wanted in too and it was powerful enough that it thought it could do it. So in 1899, the United States issued the open door policy. It was a letter sent to many European countries that said, hey guys, no need to fight over China. China's ports are equally accessible to everyone, including us. So now we have all the European countries and the United States using the skills they learned in kindergarten to share China. Of course, the Chinese government was not consulted. There was another country next to China that was watching what was going on in interest and fear. For almost 250 years, Japan had had a closed country policy. They would trade with the Dutch, they would trade with the Chinese, they would trade 
with no one else. They were not interested in Europeans' trade deals. They were not interested in having European feet on their soil. They feared that as soon as they opened their doors to Europe, they would be colonized or bullied into terrible trade deals. They were probably right, but they couldn't stay isolationist forever. In 1853, Commodore Matthew Perry of the United States sailed to Japan in his black ships and demanded that Japan open her doors and her ports. Japan politely replied, no thank you. But Matthew Perry persisted, and he engaged in some gunboat diplomacy of his own. On the 4th of July, he loaded his cannons with blanks, pointed them to the, toward the capital city, and began firing. The Japanese, who did not have a military that could take on the United States, took the hint and opened her ports. So now Japan was open to European trade, and she knew that she had to take quick and decisive action if she were to avoid ending up like China. Beginning in 1868, Japan underwent a rapid period of industrialization and westernization. They changed their government to look more like Western governments. They started dressing in Western clothing. They started eating Western food and listening to Western music. The hope was that since Western countries believed that Western culture was superior to other cultures, if they saw Japan adopting Western culture, they would respect Japan and recognize her as an equal. It didn't work. Japan could change her culture. She couldn't change the color of her people's skin and racist attitudes still abounded in the West. Hmm, thought Japan, I need a new plan. What do Western countries have that we don't? What are they doing that we aren't? Ha! Huh. Imperialism. We need a better military, we need colonies, and we need them now. So Japan starts building up her military, starts modernizing her army and her navy. And in the 1904-1905 Russo-Japanese War, she showed the West what she could do. She fought Russia and won. Well, it was sort of declared a tie, but that was mostly because the West was embarrassed by how badly Russia was losing. Japan took a colony, Korea. She was all set to begin the period of imperialism that would lead straight into her part in World War II. And it worked. Japan's military might had impressed the rest of the world. She was now respected as a world power and was the only non-white nation to be invited to the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I. And so we end today with the poor struggling to survive and some people doing their best to help them and others arguing that the poor would be better off dead. With the world parceled out into colonies, the lion's share going to European countries, another portion going to the United States, a small portion going to Japan, and the world stage quickly being set for a series of conflicts that would rock our civilization. Thank you. I'll see you next week. Bye.